All right, guys, we are live. Anything you say now will be archived on YouTube forever, so be careful. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Starting the show. <clears throat> and welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me on today's show is episode number 339. 339. Uh, I'm going to be talking with Mr. Joseph Lenaski and a someone who hasn't been on the show in, I feel like, what, seven to ten years or something? Andy Biggs was lost <laughs> in Africa. We found him, and he's back now. <laughs> so, hey, guys, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks you. for having us. All right, Andy, let's let's start with you. Like I said, you I think you were on the show. It had to be, like, what are we, 2013? It was like 2011, I feel like, you were on the show last. Yeah. And then you were saying, yeah, I'm going to Africa, and then I didn't hear about you. I didn't hear from you again, so... I was thinking well, it's a common well, thing. Really back? <laughs> yeah, it's a common thing. I, I go, I come back, I go, I come back. You know, three, four, five times a year. So, yeah. in fact, I just got back uh, three days ago and dealing with jet lag. So, wow. glad to be back. Glad so, be what, back. what were you doing? Another tour, obviously. But what, how did it go? Yeah, I spent um, I don't know um, three weeks in Botswana. Then I came home for Thanksgiving and then headed right back and ran another trip. So I had three different safaris in a little over a month. Wow. And it was great. It was great. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, it was awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> Testing out new equipment, just kind of, just kind of out there cruising around, having fun. Yeah. What well, What are you shooting out there these days? You know, I've got, um, I've got, I picked up medium format. What? Um, you go in the yeah. opposite direction. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's moving to these little small things, and I moved to something a lot larger. And so I moved to a phase one. Um, 80 megapixel camera. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like jumping in at the deep end. 80 <laughs> megapixels on a yeah. phase one in Africa. That sounds like a dream, man. What, what, so no, what was, no, why? why? Why Why do you need all that? What, what was the purpose? Bigger's better, I guess. No, I mean, you know, I, I um, if I can make larger prints, I can sell them for more. So prints, it's, it's yeah. an economic model that works. Yeah. Uh, but it's really frustrating at the same time, you know, shooting one frame a second, ISO 100, maybe 200 in a stretch, autofocus limited to one point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for wildlife photography, it is not exactly the smartest choice, but it's not my only uh, system in the bag. So I was going to say that. Shoot. It can't be your primary. What's your, what's your, what is your primary camera out there? It's still it's still um, Nikon and Canon equipment. I, I kind of rotate between them. I borrow or or um, or rent what I don't own. I own yeah. a D eight hundred E, a seventy to two hundred, and a couple of small lenses, and then I just rent the rest. I yeah. just yeah, no reason to buy anymore. That's that's the way to go. And then <laughs> when something new comes out, you grab that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Well, well, well welcome back, man. It's good to Thanks. good to have you back. I'm glad we were able to snag you while you were. Sort of cooling your jets in the United States for a minute. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming on. So also, with somebody who hasn't been on the show in a while, Mr. Joseph Lenaski, also known as the Aperture Expert. Hey, Joseph, what's going on, man? Howdy, Frederick. Yeah, you know, good to be here yeah. again. You are, I'm looking at your uh, your feed there. It looks like you're in a nice, pretty, white, perfect studio. What's going it's, on? Well, that's not called perfect, but it's a, it's a big, very cold, 1,000-square-foot warehouse that uh, you know, I moved into... Earlier this year is my studio, and it's coming together. It's really coming together. It is well below freezing outside most days right now, though, and so I'm cool. having some heating issues. Got to get that. So that thing behind, you can kind of see it there. There's a huge door, big, huge garage door, and um, a lot of air comes through that. A lot of heat goes out of that, so I'm trying oh. to get that resolved. But, yeah, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty cool space here. I like working here. That's cool. And what, what, what have you been up to lately? What's, uh, what's the latest project on your docket? Well, the latest thing, for those who haven't seen it, was I did a full-on relaunch of Aperture Expert. It's a, it was a major undertaking, took many, many, many months, and that is now live and still going through lots of tweaking and new features getting added almost every day, it seems. But that was the big project for quite a while. And what then, was uh, what was the driving force for that? Did you was it just refreshing or making it more organizationally out, stable? Yeah, it just outgrew the platform it was on before, and there was just no. I had hit I hit a wall over a year ago, probably two years ago, and I wanted mm -hmm. to grow, and I just couldn't with where I was. So, I put some thought and design into it, and redesigned the whole thing. So the forums are much more robust. Cool. The store now is one where you can go back and see your previous purchases and re-download your previous purchases. Mm. Um, yeah, you go to your own profile page and you can see every post, every tip, every comment, every forum comment you've ever made all in one place. That's cool. It's That's cool. it's really, really cool. What, what platform are you on right now? Drupal. Drupal. Wow, you see? 
We got to talk about that offline because I don't I don't know much about Drupal, but I know from yeah, funny neither do I. <laughs> fully, yeah, you hire out, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. People that 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 standardize on Drupal are like, yeah, it comes with a developer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not the kind the of readme is a developer. You know? Yeah, so, cool, but it's working for you, huh? Yeah, it's awesome. Really awesome. Well, cool. Well, welcome back to the show. It's good to good to hear your voice and see you. All right, guys. Thanks, let's sir. uh let's move on with the show. Before we continue, I want to thank this week's sponsor, at least one of them, and that's Audible.com. All right, we are at the, we're coming up at the end of 2013. You guys believe that? It's almost the end of 2013. As I get older, these years are like, I don't know where they're going. I feel like it's still 20, 2009 or something. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we're moving into 2013. I mean, before we jump into the story, so the story is we're going to talk about photography tech trends of 2013 and, and kind of bat back and forth what we think were the, the kind of standouts of that. But personally on you guys, so Andy, you first, like of 2013, the things that you've done business-wise with Gura Gear, with the workshops and trips and personal development, what do you feel like was the standout thing that you're like, okay, 2013, I really pushed the Sisyphus rock forward a couple of inches <laughs> with, <laughs> with this thing. Well, for me, I, I, I learned what my boundary is as far as <laughs> time away from home. <laughs> um, yeah, that that's it, it push it, pushing that rock a little too far. I'm looking at my wife over there right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we... we um, God, I don't even know. I mean, I, I feel like I've shot fewer images this year than I've ever shot, but yeah, I've had... You. Yeah, and then I just like each year my, my take gets lower and lower, um, but my number of keepers is the same each year, I, I feel. So, so you're getting you know, better? Not better. I think I'm just getting more picky, and mm. I'm learning to see a little bit better, and it's not about gear. It's not about anything else other than yeah. just, just time out in the field. Um, yeah. So this year, I spent so much time in the field is probably what I, I leave this year <laughs> with. Wow. You know, how much, how much uh, you got to be, like, you must know stewardesses and, or flight attendants <laughs> by first name. Like, hey, Andy, like Norm on Yo. Cheers. Andy! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know you travel too much when dot, dot, Yeah, dot. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how, how are the kids, Joan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So traveling. So how, how long, how many months out of the year, out of 2013, do you figure you were actually away from home? Three or four. Oh wow! Jeez, yeah. yeah, a good quarter of the year. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. wow. Big time. Okay, and then what about Gear? How's that? How's the 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 camera bag company going? It's doing great. In fact, we just launched a new brand, a sub brand called Ogden Made, and it's not only limited to camera equipment. It's um, we're making um, uh, side shoulder bags and other kind of accessories that are really more for any person to buy, not just photographers. Yeah. But the whole the whole idea is that it's built and made in Utah, U.S. made, and it's not made overseas. And so, um, so just kind of expanding the line out sideways to different types of um, customers. It's a great yeah, thing. That's crazy. See, like that that is what blows me away. I gotta <clears throat> clearly, you guys, like both of you guys, are doing all kinds of stuff, and clearly, you found some sort of secret, like time machine thing that allows you to split space and time and be in more than one spot at the same time and no, do you know all this stuff. Because you're you know like you multiple need? companies, a family, and you're flying, and you're, no, no. you know, and you're on the show. How does that happen? You know? it's, all about, it's all about elves. It's all about yeah. elves. You there know? you go. There I, you, I, go. I, you know, I think Scott Kelby figured that out years ago. It's just all about having as many elves as possible. There you go. There you go. I need to get some of them elves or something. It's... <laughs> Because clearly this one elf ain't doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Joseph, what about you? If you had to, if you had to pick one thing for 2013, that was like, okay, we I pushed it forward again. That Sisyphus rock, I pushed it forward, and I feel good about this one thing that I did. And maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just you know sort of the rising tide of everything that you're working on rose, and so everything's good. What yeah. would you say? What would you What would you pick? Well, I, this year has actually been a pretty tremendous year for that. It's, I mean, you're looking at one of them, the studio. I right? moved into yeah. here this year, and that was a, a huge step for my my photography career. And the the After Expert launch, you know, that was a major investment in time and money, and just making sure that it's ready for what's coming. 
which yeah. you know we all just hope that hope that it was worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> the, what we hope that's coming. The rain. What we hope is coming. <laughs> so just for the folks that may not know, what what are you waiting on to show up? What's the what's the big thing? You still there, Joseph? Uh oh, I think we may have uh -oh. lost. Uh oh, Joseph, you still there? All right. This may think, be on the things for 2014. <laughs> yeah, I think. Better see, you guys have the time machine. <laughs> I think <laughs> Joseph may have gone into a time warp. All right, let's move on. Well, Joseph, I can see him, so I I know he's there. So he's working out his issues. Let's move on, Andy. Let's let's just jump into the story number one, and that's photography yeah. tech trends of 2013. Yeah. We've listed a few of some of the big ideas. I'm going to list them down, and and you tell me when I get through this. Tell me if any of these are like okay. These, yeah. these should be the, the number one. So um, in no particular order, there was social media things. And just this last week, Instagram and Twitter, over the past week or so, they both enhanced their direct messaging capabilities to allow you to send messages with photos directly to and from, in the case of Instagram direct, to and from uh, a single person or a group of people instead of your entire feed whenever you make a post. So you can send, kind of have private conversations now. Uh, then there's wearable gear with Google Glass and then the one-handed DSLR stuff. And then we've got smartphone technology and sort of the merging of, of capable cameras with phones. And Sony's lens camera is an indication of that. And then there's going in the opposite direction with retro gear like Nikon's DF, you know, kind of saying, hey, people like this retro stuff. Let's do more of that. <laughs> So, yeah. so they looks like they did that and then turned it up to 10 with the Nikon DF. And then education and technology, like Trey Radcliffe launched the Arcanum. Um, we've got Digital Photography School. You mentioned Kelby Training, Creative Live out there, all these different things, ways for people to learn about photography. And then last but not least, at least on this list, are drones or unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, you know, and... and from companies like DJI where we have these these highly capable and almost magical devices that you can fly around with gyroscopes and GPS units and cameras built into them <laughs> to get these perspectives that you've never seen before. So of that list, which one of these things are you like, oh man, yeah, that's it? You know, what do you think? Andy? You know, well, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll work the other end. Like, what's the dud? For me, the yeah, dud. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> the dud is absolutely... Uh, a couple of things. First of all, that that Sony lens that connects to the, QX. the camera. Yep. Yeah, just you know, it's a great idea. I love that that, that they're investing in new ideas. It's going to be a, a commercial dud, yeah. but it's neat that they're pushing the boundaries. I, I like that. I like they that. They try and do stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 I, I'm going to go against the grain also and say that I think the Nikon DF is also a dud. And I'm going to be very unpopular for saying that, but <laughs> I'm already it, it, unpopular for for saying that. I called it a dud when it came out. <laughs> so. Well, I I was looking at it thinking, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, okay, they they took out some, you know, a lot of features. The ergonomics is horrible. I shot with it last week, and uh, but then twenty eight hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Come yeah. on. Come on! <laughs> I know. I just gotta. I just gotta see the marketing guys, like Joseph. You know, sitting in marketing meetings at these big companies, you can see marketing guys are like, you know, hey, what, what's the price point for this? And there's a guy in the back of the room that says, you know what, you guys are thinking about this all wrong. <laughs> we, gotta, <laughs> we gotta go higher, add another thousand bucks to the price, and we'll build on their price perception. People will have to have it. <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so, but at, at the end of the day, I think the coolest tech of the year is actually Google Glass. Mm -hmm. um, it's may not it, it's a version 1.0 product, but where it's going, I think it's a pretty cool it's a, it's a cool direction. Yeah, because yeah. it's fully integrated with other things. Yeah, it is. I heard a rumor, by the way. Let me let me grab my glass. Jeez, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned it. I wasn't gonna pull it out. All right, I gotta put on my glass here. Here we go. Oh yeah. Show there you go. Off. Now I'm fully Show geeked off. out now. So I heard a rumor. I don't know if it's it's confirmed, but I heard a rumor there was an iPhone app. Cause right, cause to date there's only an Android app. You can use these with yeah. your iPhone, just connected through Bluetooth. But to get all the features like navigation and all that, you need the iPhone app to go with it. I heard it's coming out very shortly. So well, I saw something about how it was released and then there was a it was pulled. Yeah. That which which. Yeah. To me, is like a submarine near the surface of the water that just peaked up to see <laughs> and then went back down, which means hopefully it'll surface again soon. 
and we'll be able to use this. Yeah, I got to take these off. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got um, an email for an invitation for those, and I just I somehow clicked delete, and a few days later, I kind of went, you know what? I think I should have should have done it. If you want an invitation, let me know. I might know a person that could send you one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they ain't cheap. I'm telling you, it's not. Uh, you know how much they cost, right? To be a beta tester. Yeah. Let me let me go be- right behind here and yank a few of those Christmas presents off <laughs> underneath the tree. <laughs> take them back. Or a lens. So basically, <laughs> this is like this is like uh, three quarters right here of a Nikon DF. Right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and, but and that's excluding the cost of getting an Android phone and all the other stuff too. Right, right. But I'm an yeah, iPhone but you're right. Fan. You're right. Technology. This is this definitely representative of some really crazy technology. The wearable stuff. Yeah, it's really cool. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. What else you got? Hmm. Anything else, Andy? No, I think that's it. I mean, I uh, before the show notes came out, I actually did not know about um, the Arcanum, and oh. I was. It, I've been living under a hole for the last month and a half, so yeah. um, I had to kind of dig my way out of an information void. And it actually, I just had this vision of a of a big dung beetle mound in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> actually, what you need to do is look through my 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 Google Plus feed, and you'll find a link to uh, one of my uh, travelers who works at Google on the on the Google Plus Photos team, mm-hmm. and he put a video of. Uh, a termite explosion one night cool. during Jeez. dinner. So <laughs> during dinner, <laughs> yeah. tasty, nice, appetizers, it was awesome. perfect. <laughs> it was awesome. But but one one quick thing regarding uh, yeah. you had mentioned uh, aerial drones. Yeah, I think I think that's a cool technology. I think it's really neat. But I think think it's already quickly being overused as a creative crutch. Mm. Meaning, uh, in in a similar way that we I think of like HDR. It's got a use and it's got a time and a place, but it's often used as a crutch to to kind of dig people out of a lack of creativity. And I think that's what's going to happen with aerial drones is we're going to see a lot of Me Too, the same looking photographs that are just different angles of something, but not necessarily convincing, convincing, you know? Yeah. So uh, What I would like to see is folks like you, Andy, take out one of these drones and... and (laughs) I mean, no, seriously, and take it out when, on one of your workshops and get shots that we haven't really necessarily seen of, you know, the, the things that you're shooting, like, say, a herd of wildebeest or whatever out there yeah. from the air hovering or something like that. See, those things would be interesting, not just another angle of a bride or here's the Golden Gate Bridge from this angle. You know, I'd want to see something cool like that, like sweeping video or even a still of places yeah. where I wouldn't normally be able to go. So even on your workshops, you can't get that shot without a drone, right? Without hiring a helicopter or something. And they're pretty loud, so I ha- I'd have to do it in a very in a place oh, without right. <laughs> without many restrictions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Well, for well, my Joseph, money, you can never see too many videos of drones smacking into grooms' heads. So. <laughs> I saw that. I or, saw or, that or, or going into Icelandic waters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joseph, you you dropped out for a second there. What I, I don't I know did. how much you caught, uh, but I was I was asking Andy. I was reading down this list of I got the that. Uh, some the, you got that. Okay, yeah, I did so get that. What I are your I missed, what are your, I missed your response to whatever what I had last said? So I don't. My, what did you last say? I, I lost it. We'll I have no idea either. Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll rewind we'll the video continue. later and find out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So looking at the list, uh, you know, you you call that Sony camera a dud, and and I I agree with it in the state that it's in, but. Yeah. You know, Frederick, that is that is what we've been asking for in many regards when we keep saying, you know, stop, the camera manufacturers, stop trying to build an interface, stop trying to, um, uh, st- you know, stop, stop trying to build the whole UI in the back. Just give me a camera that I can slap my iPhone into, plug my iPhone sure. into, and that'll make it the camera. Yeah. And that's, it's a step in that direction. And I haven't played with it. I haven't touched it, so I can't say how good it really does work. But the whole idea of having to connect my phone to my camera and it taking 10 seconds or whatever... Even if it's a second, it's just a, it's a second too long. And exactly, that's, just... and that's that, Joseph. I'll tell you that I have one of those, and I have the QX10, <clears throat> and that's the major problem with it. Um, I've tried it with my Moto X, which is an Android phone, and my iPhone. And and you're you're 100 percent on the the proof of concept is there. It's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> just the idea that you can use the smarts in your smartphone, use a lens, and do all kinds of shots that you normally couldn't do because it's connected through Bluetooth, which means you can yeah. throw the lens somewhere else and then control it, which you can arguably do with other cameras as well. Just this is a smaller lens-type form factor. But the problem that I found on the iPhone is it's to initially pair it 
takes a long time. Like literally, it takes a long time just for that first pairing. After the ah. first pairing, and it knows the network, then it's quicker. But it, Joseph, like you said, it's still too long. It's still, yeah. it's still, you know, you're like, okay, here's a great shot, even if it's a, of your kid or something, and you're fumbling and getting this thing ready, and boot, then the moment's gone. There's yeah. not. We're used to being able to click a flick a switch or click a button. Lens comes out, shoot, we're done. Put the camera away. This is more of a concerted effort. With yeah. the with the Moto X that has NFC technology built into it, it's much cooler, but still a little bit too slow. Because with the NFC technology, you just tap your phone to the camera, and the camera wakes up. It lens extends. It does the handshake pairing on the background, and you're looking at an image right mm. there. So it's just tap instead of punching in and finding the network and joining it and all that stuff. So it's better in that respect, but still too slow. It needs yeah. to be a little bit faster in order for us to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens. You know, I don't know about the like the Instagram direct and Twitter direct messages with pictures. I I have enough ways to send pictures to people on my phone. I really don't need more. <laughs> you need yet another one? Come on. You know, I look at my phone now, my iPhone, and I've got I have a little chat folder. And that chat folder has, I believe it's six different chatting apps. Uh, yeah, Messages, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, FaceTime, Line, and Google Hangouts. Wow. It's ludicrous, right? And yeah. I, like, yeah. I really, well, I mean, there's room for three more without having to swipe over, so maybe I should add three more to it. Yeah. But, you know, I don't need yet another way to send a picture to someone. I, don't, I really don't understand the point of that. It seems to me that Instagram is diverging from where they, their focus. But, hey, yeah. you know, it's owned by Facebook now, so who knows? Well, that was. I think. I think the Instagram move was. I'm sure they've been working on it for a while because you can't just turn it on. But you know, it's it's the war between between uh, Twitter and Instagram now, or Twitter and Facebook. You know, it's because Twitter added that capability a couple of weeks or a couple of days ago, actually, and now Instagram right. rolled it out. So we're back into that sort of cold war <laughs> with these guys <laughs> going back and forth, adding, like you said, Joseph, arguably adding features that you know most people It'll... probably don't need right now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Really so. don't. Hey, Andy, do you use that stuff? I mean, are you are you doing Instagram? I, I mean, I, I know you're not uploading 50, 50, <laughs> like 50 megapixel or 80, 80 megapixel, megapixel. <laughs> 80 megapixel images to Instagram. So what, what do you no. do? You use it at yeah. all? No, I don't use it at all. Um, and but and then I do a little bit of the Twitter stuff, but I I find that just like if you're not paying attention every second of the day, you're missing something, yeah. and that, that's really that's really a difficult information source for me. Uh, yeah. I've got a busy day every single day. I'm on the phone. I'm on email. I'm doing all these different things, and it, I, I can't sit there and stare at a screen and just watch the feed just grow, right? Yeah. And uh, so I've kind of chosen my battle as being more Google Plus and Facebook. Yeah. And yeah. Instagram is kind of, I don't know. I don't take photographs of my food. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's that, <laughs> and then there, I mean, there's that, and then there's the the whole. And we've talked about this on Twit before, Joseph. You may have been in some of those conversations where we talk about the terms of service around Facebook and Instagram, sure. yeah. which the ASMP, who's having a holiday party tomorrow night in San Francisco, by the way, um, <laughs> so the ASMP um, is has been lobbying heavily for photographer rights in regards to Facebook's terms of service, Facebook slash Instagram's terms of service. Um, when you sign up and anything you post up there can be used, you know, is the, the essence of it. And, you know, the whole liking thing where when you like something, you, people can basically advertise the fact that you liked it to your friends and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah so I, I hear you. And, you know, for me, I did, a, I did a talk at a user group last night, and it was on marketing. And I think someone, someone brought up the question of where do you post and, and all that because there's so many so many services out there that are trying to pull our attention away. Like we've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, um, Google Plus, you know, it's just, and then more and more keep showing up trying to get our attention. Where do you place your bets? And my advice was Google Plus and Facebook right now. Yep. I mean, if, if you had to choose two horses, it'd be Google Plus and Facebook. If you're a photographer like we are, I do it in that order, Google Plus, mm. then Facebook. You know, if you're not a photographer, maybe the reverse. So, I don't know, Joseph. What do you think about that? When you're so Andy. Andy's a busy guy. You're a busy guy as well. Are you uh, Are you able to, to spread around and do all these networks, or are you picking and choosing as well? Well, it's a bit of both. I mean, I do. I love Instagram, and I use that a lot. And I know you know rights are gone, yada yada. But hey, whatever. Um, I mean, I'm not 
I'm not posting commercial work on there. I'm posting more casual Joseph, stuff. You so. are the consummate food poster. I gotta tell well, you. Well, that's because <laughs> I cook, so I, I get the fence there. I'm, I'm Every time I, I cook. whenever I feel bad when I look at your feed because I'm like, man, Joseph's eating that delicious meal. Is my microwave dinner ready yet? <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I do it. No, exactly. uh, no, we cook, so that's you know, it's not like I'm posting pictures of my McDonald's hamburgers. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that's that is fun, and you know, travel food. It's all part of. It. And for me, food is part of the travel experience. So if I'm traveling, of course, I'm posting on the food. Yeah. But yeah, the the I post to Instagram, but then from there, it automatically goes to Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Foursquare. Maybe not LinkedIn, but wherever the hell it goes, it goes everywhere. You know, from yeah. that one place. So I don't specifically post to the other networks. Uh, it unfortunately doesn't post to Google Plus, so occasionally I'll go in there and I'll upload a few pictures, but it doesn't do that automatically, which is a little unfortunate. And then for the Aperture side of things, you know, Aperture Expert, it does push to Facebook and it pushes to Twitter, and that's all automated. So yeah, that that's yeah, and, and those I, are important. It's it's that that's interesting, and I do that sometimes as well. But one of the one of the issues that we that that I see in putting on my marketing hat is when you do the automated posting and the automated automated syndication of posts from one network to the other the engagement on those other networks drops dramatically in other words if you you know it seems like you're killing multiple birds with one stone but you're really not because each one of those networks has a different sort of vernacular and tone sure. so to really do it right you it, there's no way around going in there and writing a Google Plus post and then writing a tweet and then writing a Facebook post because it's different <laughs> on each one. So yeah, yeah, except like for me, I'm not interested in, in engaging in conversations on each one of those networks. Yeah. I'm trying to drive traffic back to Aperture Expert. That's where I want the conversation to happen. And of so course, there are always anti-social media guy. There you go. <laughs> now there there are conversations that happen on the other networks, um, yeah. and Google Plus is the most for that for sure. But it's not. That's not what I'm driving it to. I'm putting up the excerpt, uh, you know. On um, when it goes to Twitter now, they've got these Twitter cards that have now set up on my online. So if you're on a Twitter client, Twitter branded client, you see the Twitter card. So instead of just the title, you actually see a thumbnail and the excerpt from the from the post. Cool. Uh, so that's cool. And you know, it's just again, it's all about just getting that basic. Here's the post. Here's the title. Hopefully, a blurb about it, and then driving people back to the site to read the whole thing. So it's business. What, it's business yeah. for you. It's not. It's not about making friends and getting likes and and talking about stuff. It's the the overall driving factor is to drive traffic back to a Aperture Expert, correct? From the business side, yeah, certainly. From Facebook. I, I use Facebook personally, you know, for my friends, but I don't have. I'm not friends with people on Facebook who aren't my actual friends. Right? When I get friend requests from people who are just Aperture Expert users or just Photo Joseph fans or whatever, I direct them to the fan page or whatever it's called, the the page. Yeah. Um, I don't friend those so that I can keep those two things separate. Now, you do use Facebook for personal stuff just to keep in touch with friends and, and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, the business side of it, it's all about, it's all just a place or a funnel to drive traffic back to the primary site. Got it. Got it. Remember, too, I don't, you know, I sell things on Aperture Expert. I can't sell my stuff on Facebook and on Twitter and on on uh, Google Plus necessarily. So i got to right. drive them back and make the sale there. Yeah, the analogy that I that I draw for folks when you when you try to sell too hard on social media, it's kind of like being that, you know, that that person that comes up to you in the restaurant selling flowers. No disrespect right. to those people, but it's kind of like that. You know, sure. Where you're someone's having a, a a serious conversation and you get interrupted. Hey, would you like to buy buy a flower for the pretty lady? You know, and you're that guy all of a sudden. So. Right. But as you know, the stuff that I'm posting is not. It's very rarely. You know, if there's a new product for sale, obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna say, hey, there's something new for sale. But it's not a, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this. It's here's some free information. Come to the site to read the free information. Oh, now that you're here, take a look at what else we have. Some of it's free, some of it's for sale. Yeah, and yeah, it works. It's a model that That's works. Good. That's good. It's only a matter of time before Facebook uh, starts starts uh, negating external links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is gonna be scary. Which I mean, all this is scary. And you know, I look at I look at these social networks. And Joseph, you and I have had this this conversation. I mean, years ago, offline, we were talking about marketing and social media, and the whole idea of building your email list. This is me, marketing guy, talking about business. But building your email list as sort of and your blog or your site as the center of your universe, and then using your social network presences to drive traffic back into your blog 
Mm-hmm. And hopefully some folks will, will get on your email list so that you can ma- maintain that relationship with them. Right. Like Andy, you're on, on Google+, Plus. you've got over a million followers on there, but overnight they could go away or you don't know how many of those people <laughs> you could actually reach or how many are real. But if they're on your list, you know you can reach out to them and you know that you can tell them about workshops or new bag releases or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, but I don't. I try not to 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 sell too much. I mean, yeah. I do. I do put new trip announcements on these different uh, sites, but I try to kind of uh, mix that in with more informational stuff. So, like, mm-hmm. if I'm going to post a photograph somewhere, I'm going to say, "Here's a photograph that was taken a couple days ago. Here's the equipment I took it with, and here's like a little short story around uh, the circumstances." Like, mm-hmm. um, oh, I photographed this lion in this light, and the reason why I chose this angle to the light is because dot, 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 and here's how I metered for it, and just, you know, make it useful, and it's kind of like the glue that keeps everything together, and then at some point, hey, yeah, I'm probably going to I'm probably gonna tell you about a trip that I've got coming up next year, yep. um, so that I don't tro- drive people away, Then, but I've also demonstrated that um, I can... Uh, solve people's needs, or I'm I'm a photographic educator, and I can help out somehow. Yeah. yeah. Well, Joseph, Joseph, back to back to the list, the tech trends. Uh, what about what about the Google Glass and and wearable technology? Is that uh, does that show up on your radar at all? Oh yeah, yeah. I think it's. I, I don't have Google Glass, and I would love to be playing with one, but um, oh, you don't have Google Glass. Oh, oh, oh. oh. But hold on. Let me let me show you. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me to put it on for another second. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it, Locutius <laughs> the Borg? Or what was that that uh, Star Trek reference, Locutius? Anyway, yeah, Jordy it's, I don't know. Yeah. That's something like that. There's that too. Um, no, it is extremely cool, and obviously, it is it is the beginning of a very interesting future. And I think there's going to be a lot of really, really cool stuff happening around that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's there's no question of that. You know, we've hopefully we're going to see this rumored Apple watch or whatever is going to come out there and it should be something really interesting because usually they do things that are reasonably interesting Mm -hmm. and yeah just that whole wearable technology thing absolutely there's no question about it you know i'm I'm looking forward to that too yeah i'm already wearing most of my tech and i've got a scotty vest coat that i got for the winter (laughs) it's got so many pockets in it it's like all my stuff stuffed into it it's pretty awesome (laughs) Uh, so i'm kind of wearing my tech already it's just not on my face yeah yeah well, hey, things are things are changing, and it's yeah. uh, it's it's definitely exciting. Yeah, you know, we could do a whole show on on wearable technology, I think, and with glass and just the apps that you can install in there. One of the cool, one of the cool, not to digress too much, the cool apps that um, I installed in glass was this translation app, which is like <laughs> magic. I mean, it's, it's magic. Um, wow. I forget what the name of it is, but essentially, you 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 run this little app, you just tap it, and it's running, right, and then you look at some text that's no. in a different language and it translates it no. and puts it <laughs> overlaid on the text you know, over the original text. So if you're looking at a street sign and it's in some different language, you look at it and you say, yeah, translate it. Boom. Now the street sign is in English. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. There's an app like that for the iPhone that came out yeah, a while ago. It's the same one. Really cool. It's just, is it the same guys? That's it's fantastic. the same guys, yeah. Only it, it just makes so much more sense oh, yeah. when you're looking through glass because it's oh, like, yeah. oh, yeah, what does that say? And I tried it. Andy, I tried it with a menu, you know, like that's in, that was in Spanish Yeah. because I'm in California. So I look, <laughs> <laughs> I look at it. I look at it, and it translated the Spanish to English. It was like, boom, just like that. So Go to, to Chuck and tell me how it works out. Yeah, no, yeah, I'll definitely tell you. So I'm thinking, like, in the future future, like, you know, great-grandchildren's day when they're coming up with new stuff, what if there's, like, this stuff gets to the point and processor power gets to the point where that stuff just happens automatically? And whenever you look around, you don't even notice it. Just things are just automatically in your language. And you're like, oh, I didn't realize that was in Spanish. It was, <laughs> it was in English, you know? And then, you know, voice translation and all that stuff. It just seems like it's just right around the corner. It's really exciting. Yep. That's really cool. That's really neat. Yeah. That'll be Google Contacts instead of Google Glass. Exactly. I, I yeah. wear them all the time if they were Google Contacts. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what about uh, what about drones, Joseph? What do you, what do you feel about those? Are you going to get one of those? And would that fit into your day-to-day work? <laughs> Wouldn't I'm sorry. Fit in my day to day, they're pretty. UAV, cool, not drone. UAV. 
I, you, drone sounds much more exciting. I know. It does. Like I said, can't get enough videos of those crashing into people. But uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean that's that's another great great technology. And you know, pretty soon they'll be free because Amazon's going to be delivering their packages with them, and you'll just be able to snatch one out of the sky. <laughs> you'll so. just keep it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought about that. I'm like, that seems really interesting, but you know, some neighborhoods, those those little helicopters would not make it out. You'd like <laughs> someone order some toothpaste, and the drone would just be there forever. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Man, no, if, drones are cool. I'm, I no, I don't plan on buying one. A friend of mine was telling me a story of a, a friend of his who bought some really really high end drone, and uh, he's on his third one because he kept crashing them into icebergs and things like that and <laughs> is is currently attending flight school to learn how to pilot this thing but these are really really high end so you know yeah yeah, yeah. sounds good yeah. yeah we'll see it's it's a uh, again more more stuff to, to spend money on it's just crazy well that's true but what Andy was saying about them being a bit of a crutch that's an interesting point i mean we're seeing them all over the place we're seeing footage from drones in videos where they couldn't possibly have a budget for aerial photography and so mm -hmm. from that regard it does allow people to do things for a much lower budget that they normally wouldn't be able to do and I think that's really cool you know if, yeah. if the shot merits it if an aerial shot is appropriate and you can now do it for a, a fraction of the cost of what you used to be able to that's awesome and that just goes along with everything else that we're seeing things just yeah. getting lower and lower in cost and making the tools accessible to everybody uh, you know of course we're gonna see it overused like any new technology or technology that becomes affordable all of a sudden it gets overused everybody's doing it and we'll go through a phase of that but uh, but it'll balance out and I, I think it's exciting to see for sure yeah I mean, it, I mean we're gonna talk about this in a minute in a minute just kind of what you guys think 2014 is gonna reveal for us um, but last last question for you Joseph um, the uh, you saw the Nikon DF or their their retro <laughs> camera Andy I guess Andy and myself are not really bullish on that particular body. Where, where, where do you fall on that? Do you like it? Well, I'm not an icon shooter, so it looks uh, nice. You know, it looks cool. It looks kind of like my OMD that costs a lot less than the DF. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it's funny because whenever I carry around, especially the Fuji, all the time people, the little X100, all the time people say, oh, is that a film camera? Oh, what is that? That's an old film camera? That's so cool. Mm -hmm. No, it's digital. Oh, really? really? It is? I hear it all the time. And so I would imagine DF owners will hear that. Is that film? No. And maybe that's maybe it's that's digital. part of the value proposition for that camera. People, you if you're carrying something around that's that ostentatious, then you kind of want to get stopped, right? It's it's kind of like wearing Google Glass around, you know. Where <laughs> if I wear Google Glass around, I am gonna get stopped, and people are gonna say, "Hey, is that glass? What is that? Can you tell me about it?" And with that camera, it's the same thing. You're not gonna be the undercover. OMD guy, you know, because the OMD is small. It's relatively oh, yeah. small. It's tiny. Mine is black, and I blacked out the name on it, so you can't even tell what it is. And you're not going to be undercover with a shiny 15 million dials camera. So maybe that's that was the point, you know? People, you yeah. know, if you want to be the extrovert photographer, you buy the DF. I don't know. Maybe. It's, know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject here for a second, yeah. but I think who, who, who hit the market is actually Sony. Sony hit the market with the new A7 and A7R. Mm, yeah, you know, yeah. I think it's or the right price for what you're getting, and it's smaller, and it's it's it's. I think they hit all the features and functionality, the price and the size. Yeah, yeah, I got a chance to play with that um, for yeah. for a week or so um, in Nashville a while back. Uh, on so thank you Sony for flying me out there to play with that, but it was it's you're right, it's an amazing camera. But what the negatives that I would say about that camera. Are on the A well, it's the A7 and A7R, right? So right, yeah. The A7R is the big brother to the A7, obviously. The it's a little loud, so you're not going to use it. You're not going to be sneaking up on, you know, lion cubs with that, Andy. So, <laughs> so <laughs> louder like, than a regular DSLR, or just louder than a like a Micro Four Thirds small it's, camera. It's I think it's louder than a regular DSLR because it, it when you hit the shutter release button, you actually hear two actuations. It goes. Clunk, clunk, clunk. Kind of like your old school film uh, medium format cameras, you know, with the really? kind of flappy shutter in there. It kind of it sounds like that. It's like ka clunk, ka clunk. Whenever wow. you take a shot. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So there's that's the first thing, and then the second thing is on the marketing side. I think they 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 could have marketed it stronger in terms of maybe releasing the A7 first. Because that's more of a that's more of your everyday walk around yeah. camera that's good for everything, right? So the A7R is more of your medium format, more considered, 
you know, you're going to sit on a tripod, you're going to take the shot and then move on to the next shot. You're not running and gunning with the A7R. So if they yeah. had released that A7 and said, yeah, this is awesome, you know, this is Sony's first step into this world, blah, 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 you know, it's going to be cool. And then a couple of months later, maybe six months later, whatever, release the A7R saying, okay, we took everything we knew about the A7 and now we, you know, it's here's this large sensor and it's, you know, more, or more megapixels rather and it's just the better camera for the landscape and more considered photography. I think people would have understood it more. So right now, mm. people look at them both because they, they look identical when you hold them side by side. Or, right, that's what I thought. Yeah, there's no difference. You cannot tell the difference except for the R on one of them. So when people make the purchasing decision, of course, if you have the money, you're going to say, yeah, I want the R. You know, of course, I got to get the best one that they have. I'm going to get the R when that's not necessarily yeah. the right choice for you. So, hmm. yeah, so it could have been, it, I think it could have been, Andy, I think you're right. It's a, it's an awesome, both of them are awesome cameras, full frame mirrorless cameras from Sony, but they could have been released a little bit stronger on the marketing side and communicated to at least to our constituency a little bit clearer as to w the audience. Why would you choose, for, yeah, Why would you choose one over the one. other? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you, Andy, I would say you're the R guy. I would be an A7 guy. So, yeah. I would I would be one of each. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, you would be both. But see, then the yeah. problem is you're like, okay, let me put some orange spray paint on one of them so I can tell them apart. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah I'm just I'm wondering if it's a matter of time before I start to see people not bringing digital SLRs with, you know, big mirrors and all that other stuff that go along with it on, on my trips. You know, they're wildlife trips primarily. Yeah. I wonder how long before I start to see, you know, uh, four-thirds, mirrorless, whatever, show up. I, I think, think, I think it'll yeah. be relatively soon. Yeah, I'd say you're yeah. on the trip. Yeah. I'm yeah. surprised you haven't already. I yeah, because if one. I came, I would bring mirrorless. I, would, yeah. I don't think I'd bring my Nikon DSLR gear. I would bring a mirrorless camera. I saw one two years ago. Um... That was it. Was a Panasonic. That was the last time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting. That's, that's that's what I'm shooting with primarily right now is the Panasonic GX7, the uh, you yeah know, the Lumix GX7. That's uh, I'm in love with that camera. It's you know it, it, I've had it for several weeks now, what a month and a half or so, and mm -hmm. it's still we're still on the honeymoon. So <laughs> you know, we're <laughs> you still exploring broken up each other. <laughs> well, a more appropriate question: What don't you have? <laughs> uh, I, I I don't have a lot. This is all this is the painting with pixel phase one. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have that Sony A7. I don't have the A7R. I don't have a drone. So if you're listening, Christmas gift buyers, that's these are the things I don't. Uh -huh. have. Yeah. Do you have a public <laughs> Amazon wish list, Frederick? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't need anything. I don't really. Don't. But you know, I do want. Speaking of micro four thirds, I do want that Panasonic GM. Have you seen that? You guys seen that little camera? Yeah. It's yeah. a little, it's it's like this big, literally, but it's just big enough that it can have a micro four thirds mount on it. So you have this little tiny, minuscule camera that you can put all your your micro four thirds glass on. It's crazy. So, anyway, um, so moving on. So moving out of this story, I just want to talk a little about about looking forward into 2014. So we know what we've seen in 2013. You know the wearable stuff, the drones, the online training stuff that, that's coming out and all that stuff. What about things that we need to see in 2014? What's, what, what's missing from the lineup that we need, Joseph? What, what do you want to see that you would buy right now if it was out? Oh, I don't know about buy right now. An affordable uh, uh, medium format digital. There you go. <laughs> oh. Okay. I can yeah, agree I, with that. I agree that, with that, that, yeah. That's where I want to go. Um, you know, you know that I've already gone to the Micro Four Thirds. Obviously, I still have yeah. my DSLRs, and that's what I shoot with in the studio. But that's pretty much the only place I shoot with it now, is yeah. in the studio. And at that point, I'd much rather be shooting with medium format. But you know, I don't have the thirty to eighty thousand dollars to drop on a system and a couple of lenses. So, Andy, it's uh, <laughs> he rented. Right? You look at Andy's like, ah, oh, hello. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's why that he is... has such a small Christmas tree back there, Jules. <laughs> <laughs> sponsorship does help. I, 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 I will admit, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, phase one sponsorship. Let's talk. <laughs> now that is where I'd like to go. I would really like to go that direction, and so making that more affordable is, of course, uh, would be an easier way to make that happen. So that's something I would really like to see. And I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know if it means it's a you know twenty thousand or ten thousand or five thousand. I don't know, but it's 
it's rich right now. And I know you can get into used systems for a lot less, and I know that the used media format are still phenomenal cameras, so that yeah. is most likely what my first foray will be into a Phase 1 system. But, but uh, if you if you go that route, you know, something's got to give in some direction. They're going to take the camera, that, that 80 megapixel camera Andy has, and just drop the price on it. What would be the 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 features or the the pieces, the capabilities of that particular camera that you'd be willing to part with in order to have a lower price camera? It's hard to say because I haven't worked with one like that. The only one I've worked with, I had the Leica S2 that I borrowed from okay. a friend for a while. It's the only medium format I've shot with, and that had its own peculiarities to it. But I don't know. I mean, the whole reason I want to do it is the the big sensor. It's not even the resolution. It's the bigger sensor and the image quality that you get off of that huge sensor. And those, yeah. That, that's what it's all about. I certainly don't do anything where I need 80 megapixel, although if I had it, I'm sure I'd find a use for it. And to be fair, the sculpture series shots that I did on that S2, on that Leica medium format, which was 46 megapixel, if I remember, something like that, I did. Some of those were still scaled up 200%, so I guess in that regard, sure. If I had 80 megapixels, I wouldn't have to scale it. I'd be going just straight, uh, yeah. you know, straight from camera, which yeah. would be awesome. Uh, there's no question about it. But that's not my primary work. It's, it's more about the quality of the image than, yeah. it, than about the resolution. Cool. Andy, Which is why, Andy, sorry, this is why the things like the Sony, even at 24 megapixels or 30 meg, whatever the heck it is, that's awesome, right? But I don't need that many megapixels off that size of a sensor. If I'm going to get that many megapixels, I want a big sensor to back it up. Yeah. 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 Andy, Andy what about you in, in terms of what you would like to see? What's on your, what's on your wish list and especially, you know, from the traveling photographer, because I'm sure you, you you beat the heck out of your stuff. It's not sitting on a tripod, right? So, yeah, what, uh, what, what do you say? That, but we can't say that too loudly because I rent half my gear. <laughs> <laughs> but it's insured. It's okay. Borrow lenses. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you hit the nail on the head right there. Borrow lenses, sure. yeah. Um, uh, actually, what I like every year is to see the Canon and Nikon guys kind of kind of leapfrogging each other. So yeah. I think... I think this year was kind of the year that Nikon uh, stole the show. They came out with the D800, and Canon just sat there with their thumbs in their ears, you know, like, oh, we didn't anticipate this, right? Yeah. And I would really like Canon to come out with a camera next year that was like the original 5D or 5D Mark II that just sells like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what I want. And maybe but what it's are we, a, you know, that yeah. you, you say that, but, it, but over the past year, it seems like, or let's let's take the past five years and and just sort of look at it. And the the way that I kind of, you know, I don't know, the way that my geek brain has been sort of waiting for cameras has been like, okay, Nikon makes a new camera release. Ah, oh, you know, it's almost like it used to be with Adobe when a new version <laughs> of Photoshop came out. You know, the clouds parted and and a disk uh -huh. fell out, and you know, and you've got layers <laughs> now. Oh, we've got this now. Oh, we've got you know. All this cool stuff used to happen, and then you know the engineers would go back for a year or so, bake, and then come out with something else magical that changed our lives. It exactly. seems like that's that's gone now. I mean, I don't, I, totally I don't see like from Nikon or Canon, like with Nikon and the DF, I really got the feeling that they're just like grasping for straws and like, what can we do different to re-inject some life into the market? I'm seeing, and I don't know if it's because I have, do I have blinders on for mirrorless right now or what? But I'm like. Why does it seem like all the activity is coming on my on on the Micro Four Thirds or the mirrorless side with Sony, for example? You know, yeah. doing all this other cool stuff. It's like Sony and Panasonic seem like they're doing all the cool stuff, and Nikon and Canon are kind of like, uh. Well, what you know why? Know? You know? know why they've got installed base? They have an installed yeah. base that buy lenses and more cameras in that whole 35 millimeter world, and that's their that's their sacred cow. I mean, you're going to milk that cow for so long because people, you know, that whole attrition yeah. thing. Is yeah, but, <laughs> but look, but look at look at uh, look at uh, Canon's EOS M. I mean, what yeah. a horrible product, right? Yeah. It just came out, and it's just it was the wrong product, the wrong price, the wrong features, the wrong everything. Yeah. Um, even the Nikon V1 J1, th even that was better than than the EOS M, right? Mm -hmm. Which doesn't say a lot. Um, but I, I think it just it speaks to their install base, and they have to protect that somehow. And that gives a a, a huge opening to Sony to just whip them. And they're doing. I think they're doing it in that market right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've got the football. It feels like it feels like they have yeah. the football and they can run with it. But it's, their, <laughs> it's also their football drop. Right, they could fumble at any time, and Nikon and Canon 
may get it at some point and say, okay, let's reset. The emperor has no clothes. Let's do something cool now. You know, yeah. and that could happen. But what are th- what are the chances of that happening though? Do you think? I mean, especially with with the the anchor, like Andy, you say, like the anchor of the installed base of lenses that are out there for both of these guys, Nikon and yeah. Canon. You know, it goes from being a, an asset in terms of, oh yeah, we have like Nikon, we have the F mount. That's our asset. No one else can make lenses for this. Blah 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 blah. You yeah. know, and then now it's an anchor because everyone has F mount lenses <laughs> in your market, and you can't do anything outside of the F mount lens thing without co- co- kind of completely retooling. Yeah, and that, and that's where you, you you have the conversation about when does the paradigm shift happen, right? Yeah. So we're just kind of waiting for that to happen for Nikon and Canon, and Canon kind of sort of took a different approach. We're like, you know what, we're going to kind of market to and build products that extend that system into the videographer world. And that we're going to really ag- aggressively go after that. Nikon really doesn't have that resource and that background to do that. Yeah. So it's really kind of, I don't know, it's kind of an awkward position. But what I would like to see is Canon bringing out kind of a D800 large megapixel camera that's under three grand. I mean, that's really what I would like to see. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I, I shoot a significant amount of landscapes, and I like smaller cameras that have a lot of megapixels that I can put on a tripod and not have to carry around huge lenses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So bo- I hear camera on both of you guys. I haven't heard anything about computers or tablets or anything like that. Are, yeah. we, are, are we all completely satisfied on the hardware side, at least on the computing side? We don't need anything new? We don't need a faster computer or a slimmer, lighter tablet? iPad Mini is pretty darn slim and light. And <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Yeah, is that the new one? Yeah, I absolutely love this thing. Yeah. So that's that's going to keep me happy for a while, right there. Well, look at the new Mac Pro that's going to start selling tomorrow. I don't think, I don't, I don't, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not a good candidate for buying it. Neither am I. I no, am I? I mean, why not just connect a hundred dollar cable up to, to my display to a MacBook Pro, and I'm done. Right. Yeah, and that's that's. I mean, I made the decision long ago, to many many years ago, to go away from desktop computing. And my my setup is like what I'm working on right now is a MacBook, a 15 inch Mac, the Retina MacBook Pro, mm-hmm. and it's connected to a, a, a the cinema display on the right here. But that's my setup. And then when I'm done with the show, generally what I do is I unplug a Thunderbolt cable. And take it downstairs and sit on the couch and and you know do the post production. <laughs> you know I don't want to be tied to a physical location. Then you know for WPPI the same computer or CES or Imaging USA the same computer will yeah. go in my bag and it'll go with me. I have all my stuff with me. Now it gets backed up here to Drobos and whatnot, but it's right here. So the the proposition of yeah I'm going to give you an amazing amount of power, but you got to be right here to use it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't. That doesn't really appeal to me. I don't know. Well, Just there, there are users that need that. Um, yeah, of Alex, course. Yeah, of studios. Course gonna, you yeah. know, you're making the next Lord of the Rings or Iron Man <laughs> Five or whatever. You got to render all night. Yes, they need yeah. that. But but to this audience, photographers, do they? Right. No, it's it's unlikely. Too many of us will be buying those. I mean, I yeah, mean, I mean you know, I've got a 2009 iMac. That's my primary machine, and and it's fine. You know, yeah, of course, sure, it could be a little bit faster or whatever, but you know what? Yeah. It's absolutely fine. And yeah. the you're talking about the laptop and having that as your primary machine, and that's while that's tempting, I don't need that much power on the road, and now I'm doing yeah. more and more with the, with the iPad. I mean, I just yeah. did a job. I was in New York and L.A. for Mercedes, and I was shooting. I shot everything on a micro four-thirds, and I shot, and I did all my editing on the iPad. See, Are you that serious? That is cool. Yep. That is cool. Wow. Right My entire kit was that. It was really small. And my pick of the week is something that I'll show that was that is by far the biggest and heaviest thing in my bag. Um, and we got to talk about that because that is crazy. <laughs> I did a. I just shot a job last week for Sephora in San Francisco, and I this was the first kind of commercial job that I shot with Micro Four Thirds. So. I'm right behind you there, Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because that's it. Was it fashion or was it? Yeah, it was fashion. Yeah, it was it was people slash fashion photography. Because that's yeah. where I would think that's where you really do want to go the other direction and have the big super megapixel for that retouching work. No, if, no, it was fine because this was more this was mostly close up shots and portraiture and that kind of thing. So it wasn't. Yeah, but you know, but the problem with medium format is you need a lot of power and light. Oh, yeah. To, oh, you yeah. Know, so now you're <laughs> not so much tripod bound, but you are 
kind of pigeonholing pigeonholing yourself into an environment where um, you have to you have to control all the variables. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was completely fast enough. I mean, the lighting was a was a reflector and an Einstein, um, a, a palsy buff Einstein shot through a giant softbox, and it worked. I mean, nice. the, the shots looked great. I was, you know, it was I was a little timid because it was the first commercial commercial, you know, shot with an invoice attached to it that I did. <laughs> so, so like, okay, take a little risk, and you know, I brought the OMD as a backup to the to the Panasonic. <laughs> So, you know, I was I was covered, but it was still, you know, get, am I making the right decision here? And when I got back and I loaded them up into Lightroom, I was like, wow, okay, yeah, I'm sold. I don't know when I'm going to use the DSLRs for much. That's maybe cool. sports photography, but, you know, or if, or Andy, maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it depends. I would, you know, I said before, if I was to come out on one of your safaris, I would take Micro Four Thirds, and I'm sure I would bring it with me. But if it was my first one, I would probably bring the placebo at least of a full frame DSLR with me, just to, just yeah. to, you know, to make sure I wouldn't want to. You know, it's better <laughs> to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it, kind of thing. <laughs> By the way, I was just thinking about this, and and things that I would like to see in 2014. Yeah, I would like to find a reason to never have to open Photoshop ever again. And for me, for me, that is, I'm, I'm a Lightroom guy. Yeah. And as well as Capture One, um, and I like to use the Nick Collection plugins. Right. Ooh, the yeah. problem is the plugins. The, the the plugins. If you don't use Photoshop, when you're done with them, the, the button on the bottom right hand corner says Save. It doesn't say OK, and it um. basically bakes everything you do into a file. And it's usually a TIFF file or a PSD file, right? Yeah. Um, so right now I'm opening all of my images as smart layers smart objects in Photoshop so I can have all the um, the ability to go back to the, all the, the different settings in the plugins and change them and modify them over time. Yeah. But that's yeah. like just a huge resource hound just for me to own and use and operate Photoshop just for just for the ability to have layers. That's kind of yeah. stupid. Nice. So smart my layers, yeah. so my personal desire is that Nick, the Nick team at, at Google would develop a way for me to have layer-like functionality to be able to go back and modify um, aspects of what you know the processed image without having to use Photoshop. Yeah, and I know so. Joseph's response to that is going to be just use <laughs> Aperture, right? No, no, no. You get the same limitation, of course, because yeah, exactly, bake yeah. it back into it. Yeah, but and y'all, I will give you one tip. This doesn't work with all the plugins, but you know how, of course, you can save a, a preset out of any of the Nick plugins, yeah. right? Whatever mm -hmm. your your recipe is, or on some of the plugins, not all of them, you can actually save your control points as well. And it's either like hold down either command or option or some modifier when you hit save, and it um, when you save the preset, and it will save the control points with it. So it's not as good because you still have to go back to the original image, open that, but at least you could just one click apply that preset, and it would yeah. go on there with all of your control points. So yeah. something, but but I mean if you've got if you have Photoshop, you're going to do the smart layer thing, obviously. And now if you're working with 80 megapixel images to start and doing smart layers, now you do need that Mac Pro. Because yeah, that, those right. are unfortunately you're right. <laughs> that's those true. I didn't think about files. that. Yeah. Yeah. You you might be the one customer for that Mac Pro any <laughs> Well when I was doing that sculpture yeah. series and I've you know taken those um, those forty six megapixel whatever files and doubling those, I uh, very quickly discovered that uh, PSD files only have a two gigabyte limit and I was into the PSB yeah. files, the Photoshop big document, and that was like oh this file, this document cannot be saved as a PSD. It's over two gigs. What? Yeah. Wow. So, Mac Pro would be good for that. Yeah, big time. Yeah. And a 4K monitor, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Andy, I think you got your Christmas list set. Mac Pro, 4K monitor. You're good to go. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> what about, you guys? You guys mentioned Nick and Google. What about cloud? photo processing. So Google acquired Nick and we've slowly seen them trickle features from Nick into Google Plus Photos, which mm -hmm. is awesome. And I mean even the UI looks very Nick like now when you're editing yeah. photos inside Google Plus, which is which is amazing. But um, where do you guys fall on that? I mean is that when we talk about that on the show, just to frame us, we talked about it on the show before when they first started this integration and my sort of non insider thoughts of it were that's awesome, and it looks like they are trying to compete or take business away from iPhoto or from Apple on the iPhoto side and no. then from Adobe on the Photoshop Elements side. Is that wrong? What do, what do you guys think? 
Yeah. Uh, um, so first, we have to understand where Google makes their money. They make yeah. their money in search, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Advertising, Google, yeah. yeah, Google Plus is glue that keeps you on the, in the Google world, and it also makes um, it. it um, advertisers are willing to pay for a higher relevancy, right? So yeah. if, if I am somehow associated with a friend that has that has posted something and I've liked it or commented on it, and then I do a search in the bar above that, it's going to somehow know what I'm looking for better. It, it, it's a more relevant search, and advertisers mm -hmm. pay more money for that. Yeah. And Google Plus Photos, the, the Nick functionality, just adds more glue to keep you there. So I don't think it's really trying to compete against anything Okay. Other than it's just trying to create glue to keep keep you in that world, um, but but even, think, it, but even if yeah. it's not competing, it's yeah. still you can only do one thing at a time, right? So the the consumer base that would gravitate towards using Google Plus Photos over using even if it's not an explicit you know Google's aiding cannons at o Adobe and Apple, which I don't think is the case at all, but from a consumer standpoint, looking at and making choices of where they're going to store their images and what yeah. tools they're going to use to edit them. Does it make more sense for that sort of Joe consumer to choose Google Plus Photos for those images, or should they be using Elements or, you know, be yeah. putting them in the the Apple ecosystem with iPhoto? I don't know. What are you thinking? I, I definitely think that we're not the target market, obviously. Yeah, you know, of course, for what we're shooting. But, but gosh, you know, if you're if you're using a smartphone. And you want to upload everything and have it synced all the time, and I can process them. That's a pretty compelling. It is. It is. Yeah, uh, uh, product. It really is cool. Yeah, Joseph, mm -hmm. what about you? So you're Aperture expert, right? So you're you got one foot squarely in the Apple camp with the Apple software, and you're an sure. expert on that stuff. What positioning wise, looking at Google and what they're doing with Nick. How does this impact, you know, not not so much the, because you're, I, I would assume that your user base is mostly the advanced amateurs and professionals, right, right. that are using that, you're using your site and buying your products there. But what about the folks that are just down from that? They're not advanced amateurs or professionals. They're taking pictures on the road trips. They're taking pictures of their kids' first steps or food or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, is Google a better option for them or or iPhoto? Or, I think, or I think it's on its way there because... The more we can put in the cloud for your average consumer, the better. I mean, you know, when you're shooting pro or semi-pro, and you're shooting a hundred pictures of something, so that you can select one that you're then going to either print or put on Facebook or share your friends, whatever. But you're just trying to get that one or two out of the bunch. Then it's still great to have the desktop software and to have the ability to pixel peep and zoom all the way in and compare images side by side and do all that sort of thing. And yeah. sure, maybe that capability will come to cloud services eventually, but. For now, if you're just your average consumer, and basically every picture you take, you at least to you, it's a keeper because you're not shooting 20 pictures of one thing. You're going to shoot one, maybe two, and move on. Then, yeah, these what they've done with Google is fantastic. And I didn't know about the Nick stuff being on Google until you just said it. I just opened it up going, oh, man, that's what happened <laughs> to Snapseed for the desktop. It's in Google now. In Google. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. And it really is. And, yeah. Okay, so if I take a picture with my iPhone or with my Android phone or whatever, and that goes straight to Google because it automatically backs up to there, and I can go in there and I can make the adjustments and share them, that's basically what I'm doing now, except yeah. that there it's on the cloud instead of being completely local. Um, but it doesn't solve the problem of the bigger cameras that you still want to shoot with that those images then need to get to the cloud. Now, I'm a geek, right? So I've got an iFi card in my... Um, in my Fuji X100, and I shoot to that, and it transfers either to my iPhone or my iPad, and I can edit it and then publish it up. But normal people don't do that. You know, that's yeah. something for people like you and me. We normal people just don't do that. But the moment that every consumer camera, from a little point and shoot to X100 to your full-on Pro DSLR, has the ability to instantly and immediately upload to the cloud, just like your iPhone does, then things are going to start changing again. Yeah, yeah, I I totally I totally agree with you. The only thing I I disagree with is, I think I think more people than you realize are using the Wi-Fi capabilities because it's it's built in like it's built into to two of the three um, mirrorless cameras that I own. So I have a, the Sony NEX five R, I believe it is, and I have the OMD, which was my first mirrorless, and then the Panasonic GX seven. The Sony and the Panasonic, Panasonic both have built in Wi Fi and accompanying iPhone apps that you install so that they, you know, basically act as the catcher's mint if you want to send photos to your, your phone to share mm -hmm. them out or 
to control the camera to do remote shooting and, and previewing a video and that sort of thing. And I think that is a killer, killer feature. And that's one of the main features why I don't shoot that much with the OMD anymore because it doesn't have that feature in there. Right. And I use it all the time. Sure. All the time. I would love to know some numbers of how many owners of those cameras actually use the use the Wi-Fi feature. Yeah, because yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's still a new feature to have in it cameras. Is. It right? is. Not, it's not a mu- I mean, well, for a lot of us, it's a must-have. I wish all my cameras had it. Um, and if they don't, then obviously, it's, you know, that's what the iFi card does fills that gap. But yeah, I would be curious to know how many people are actually really truly using it. Because uh, yeah. it, it's, it, you still have to have that interim step, right? I've got my camera, and now I have to have an iPhone or Android phone or some other device in between, and then from there it can go to the cloud. That interim step needs to go away, and when mm-hmm. it goes straight from the camera to the cloud, just like when I take a picture on my mobile phone and it goes straight to the cloud, that's that's where we're going to start seeing a lot more cloud usage, I think. You want a, you want a cellular antenna and a Wi-Fi antenna <laughs> inside your camera. That's what you want. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's the next logical step. Yeah, no, I agree. I want that too. I want that too. I right, want guys, we're my running, everlasting we're... gobstopper, and I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're running a little bit short on time. I want to get through the picks of the week, so let's just jump into that. Um, Joseph, what's your what's your pick of the week? All right, so my pick of the week is this thing that I used on the Mercedes shoot. This is from Manfrotto. It is a pump. It is a pump mount, so it's a suction mount that you can mount onto the windshield or onto the hood of a car, and you slap this thing on, and you pump the little pump what? button on here, and it makes a super, super strong hold on it. So you can yeah. mount this on, and this is what I had. This is the biggest piece of gear that I had for the Mercedes shoot. Mount this thing on the on the hood of the car, pump it up to secure it, and then I had a little, uh, little ball head to slap on top of that so I could position the camera wherever I wanted and shoot with the camera mounted on the hood of the car, driving around Manhattan, taking pictures from the you know, view of the hood. You get the, the logo of the car, the emblem, the star of the Mercedes on there. And the hood of the car and the the great beyond and it was that's super cool. cool. That's yeah, a that's neat cool. neat device. It's about a hundred bucks, uh, so it's not you know crazy expensive. But there are cheaper ones out there. But I would definitely not recommend buying a cheap one if you're going to talk about mounting an expensive camera yeah. inside of a far more expensive car. Uh, don't save twenty percent. Just get the real one. This right. thing is is bulletproof and it's really cool. On the pump, there's a little red line around the the primer. And as it starts to lose air, because of course it will over time, that primer comes out. When you start to see that red line, then you know it's time to pump it up a little bit more. So you've got a visual reminder if it's starting to lose grip, huh? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cool. I know not everybody's going to see this on video, but for, for those who can, yeah, I don't know if you can see now, there's a little red line on this. I and mean, as you pump it, this goes in and in and in. The red line goes inside, and you know that you're good. And then as soon as it starts to peak out, you know it's time to pump it back in again. That's really cool. That is cool. Nice. I, I think I'll have to get that. I like that. And you said it's, it's around 100 bucks. Yeah. Yep, I put a put a link to it in the show notes. I bought this one from Amazon. And yeah. Wow, very cool. Very All cool. right, well, thank you, Joseph. That's a that's a perfect pick of the week. All right, Andy, what do you got? What's your pick of the week? Well, since my uh, thirty inch cinema display is on its last legs, I've been Uh-oh. looking around trying to look for a new display, and I didn't want to spend a lot of money. And um, well, NEC just announced their successor to the really really popular PA two seven one. Um, it's basically a 27-inch display. It's now called a PA272. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, it basically displays almost 100% of the full Adobe 98 color space. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not 72 DPI. I think it's 109 DPI, so it's a little bit better dot pitch. And uh, it takes up a little bit less space on the desktop than a uh, cinema 30-inch display that I'm replacing. And it only maybe like an extra or it loses like 100 pixels on one dimension. It's not much. But, uh, but it also is a closed loop system in that it comes with a full uh, calibrating and profiling hardware and software solution. It's about 1500 bucks. I just uh, uh, think that's kind of my next drool worthy item. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. And so what is it? It's 27 inches? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah it's a 27 inch uh, display. So nice. how does that compare to just the Apple 27-inch cinema display? It, it looks like it's the same resolution. So what's the kind of advantages oh, of this? So one? much, uh, <laughs> so much. Um, it's it's it is LED backlit, so it's it's nice and even all across. Um, it, it displays more colors. It's a non-glossy surface, so it is a matte screen, which is good, mm-hmm. um, especially in my environment. I've got so many lights, and it's just 
it's challenging. Mm -hmm. I don't want those reflections. I really yeah. don't. And I don't want to have to put a third-party thing over the screen just, just to reduce the glare. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really all about the amount of colors that it can show. And until you've used a, um, a large color gamut display, you really, um, I, I would say you're, you're kind of missing out because it's so much better. You can really, really see into the shadows better. You get the colors. Um, it's, it's very addictive. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So highly recommended. So you highly recommend that over the Apple Cinema display? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Right. Cool. Without, yeah. And what's the price differential between the two? I don't know, but this is about 1500 um, and that's with the hardware solution. If you don't want the hardware um, calibrating, profiling stuff, I think that you'll save two, three, four hundred bucks off of it. So. Okay. Cin Cinema display, 27 inches a grand, so that's 1000 yeah. so it's 50% well, more. But yeah, I'm looking at the, I'm just comparing the specs here and talking about this 1.07 billion color support. That's... Jeez. That's a lot of colors. That's a lot of colors. Amazing. I can't <laughs> really count that high. Yes, that's a lot of colors. Now, do you need a special <laughs> graphics card to drive that many colors? No. No, you don't. Wow. You don't. And uh, I'm over at B&H's website, and it looks like it's uh, 200 bucks less. So it's 12.99 for the non-profiling um, version. Interesting. So Ooh. anyway. Cool. All right. What's your pick? Uh, my pick. All right, I'm gonna do a quick screen share here. Uh, here we go. Let me find the window. Here it is. Okay. So my pick for those that are listening to this show is it's an app and a product, and it's uh, I think this is just oh, in time yeah. for the holidays. Yeah. It's called. Have you guys seen this? It's called. Uh, yeah. Yep. It's I've called Mosaic. One. Yeah. It's called Mosaic, and you can check it out at HeyMosaic.com. And it's in. You download this app for your phone and on your Android or your your iOS device, and basically pick a bunch of photos, hit a button, give it a credit card number. It ships the photos off to the Mosaic service, and this cool looking book. You have to go look at the video to see what I'm talking about, or go to HeyMosaic.com to check it out. But this cool looking book comes back, and it's just fantastic. It's just fantastic. I ordered. I think I ordered like so far like five or six of these books <laughs> you know, over the past two weeks, and these like are perfect Christmas gifts because they're like t what twenty bucks each or something like that. Twenty. Seriously? Like, come on. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, they're not expensive at all, and then they just show up. They're seven by seven. They show up in the mail. They're packaged very professionally and clean and just well done. You open this thing, you take a little slip sleeve off. It's got a little ribbon in there for you to lift the book up out of the little cove that they've built inside the packaging. It's just cool. really, really well done. It's the perfect Christmas gift, I think. And you can just That's sit cool. there. You can sit there on your couch and go through iPhone photos, pick 20 iPhone photos, hit the button, and tell it, hey, ship this to Grandma. Boom, I'm done. It's over. <laughs> yep. Forget about it. So, For the yeah, lazy no. Christmas shopper, I like hey, that. Uh, you say lazy, <laughs> I say efficient. I don't know. <laughs> well, in my world, in, in, the, in the African safari world, we, we call that caloric preservation. There you go. I'm preserving <laughs> calories. Yeah, this is. I'm trying to survive in the in the tech wilderness here. I need my calories. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Cool. Yeah, so definitely check that out. So, yeah, I'm happy. I actually got a box in today just before we started the show with most of my Christmas gifts, so I'm all done. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where are they shipping these from, do you know? Uh, you know, I have to look at the receipt. I'm not sure where they're coming from. So I'm sure they have a third party that's, uh, you know, that they've partnered with to make them, but yeah. I'm, I'm not exactly sure who's printing them, but whoever is doing it, they're doing a really good job. They look great. They're well-made, and they don't feel cheap at all, but they're inexpensive, so, you know, which are Very nice. the recipe for good Christmas gifts. It doesn't feel cheap, but it's, you know... Plus, you know, you're a photographer. Of course, people are going to expect photos from you, so why not just yeah. give them this? 20 yeah. bucks? That's like a deal. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's really cool. I ordered one from uh, our little anniversary trip, Weekend Getaway, and I made one. Just sat down on the couch after the trip and put one together in maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, and it was, it's great. It's really, really nice quality. I like yeah. it a lot. Yeah, cool. even their site is well done. You know, they just—they just—it looks like they just paid attention to the whole thing. They even have gift cards that you can give away. You know, it's really, really cool. So definitely check it out. Yeah, so. right on. Yeah, I, you, Fred, I forgot that we could do the screen share thing. So for those who are watching, let me just throw up a, a picture here real quick. Yeah, go ahead, take over. This oh, now security privacy preferences. Let me turn that on. So this is a picture that I took from the uh, using that mount. Oh, look at that! Yeah. Yeah. 
Is it actually showing up? Okay, cool. It I'm is, yeah. All these warnings yeah. over here. So, uh, yeah. So that was shot with the, the, the pump mount mounted on the hood of the car and driving through Manhattan. Did they let you keep the car? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. One. Fuck oh, oh, no. Yeah. I, I mean, the cars we were driving were just sick. Um, here, I'm just just one more. Now I'm going to show off. Yeah, yeah, go for this it. Was, this was the one that was the... Uh, get back to the screen sharing. Where is that? Here we go. Where is it? This was the one that was really fun to drive. Oh, no. I, oh, no. I'll try, I'll, <laughs> oh, I'll let you, you drove face. this car? <laughs> <laughs> I had that car for about a day driving around uh, L.A., Okay, for um, the folks that are listening to this, what what car was that, Joseph? Uh, that is the um, the the S the uh, SLS. That is SLS. Mercedes SLS. Oh, yeah. With yeah. gold wing. The gold wing doors, oh. AMG. It's basically a rocket, but it's a Mercedes, so it's super easy to drive. I was kind of afraid to drive it at first. I'm thinking, God, this thing's. I'm not used to driving a car like this. Yeah. Uh, nope, no problem at all. Got used to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Were, were women <laughs> throwing their phone numbers in the car for you as you? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> He's like, of course not, not Frederick. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. that was a thing of beauty, so there you that's go. That's cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys, um, let's wrap this up. Before we before we close the show off, um, again, we, we insert our This Week in Photo interviews at the end of the show, and this, this interview is very special. It's from a friend of mine. His name is Shiv Verma. He's a, he's a TWIP listener, but he's also an amazing, amazing photographer who runs workshops and is really strong in the photography community. And uh, it's this, you know, I learned a ton just from having a short, you know, 30-minute conversation with him. So, and I'm sure you will too. So definitely stay tuned after the credits to, uh, to listen to this interview that I did with Mr. Shiv Verma. All right, guys, where can, uh, Joseph, where can people go to keep up with you? So for the Aperture side of things, it's ApertureExpert.com and Aperture Expert on Twitter and everywhere else. And for the photos, check out PhotoJoseph.com. All right, PhotoJoseph. All right, Andy Biggs, again, welcome back. Where can people go to check you out? Two places, uh, AndyBiggs.com, A-N-D-Y-B-I-G-G-S.com, as well as TheGlobalPhotographer.com. TheGlobalPhotographer.com. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Look at that. Is that new? No, man. I've had that for years. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm in I'm in places other than Africa. Like uh, next year, or this year, I spent uh, a lot of March in Iceland, and then uh, let's see, next year it'll be Galapagos Islands, Antarctica, South Georgia, Falkland Islands. I'm I'll be all over. 2015, India. Oh yeah. Jeez, wow. wow, that's crazy. Well, we'll have to. Well, next time you come on, I think we'll probably be 2017 or so. <laughs> so we'll I'm waiting see, for the invitation. See, <laughs> yeah, you're always welcome on the show, man. All right, guys, um, and listeners, if you'd like to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can be sure to check us out at thisweekinphoto.com or join our community over on Google Plus. And if you're looking for me, Frederick Van Johnson, you can find me at frederickvan.com. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>